introduced, and we'd like to welcome the GSA Administrator, Emily Murphy, uh, back before the committee this morning. Uh, today we plan to engage with Administrator Murphy on a variety of matters, including uh, her past testimony before this subcommittee, as well as her management of major projects under GSA purview. First and foremost is whether the interest of the American taxpayer are being put first where they belong, or whether the personal financial interests of the President are taking precedence when GSA is making real estate and procurement decisions. To get to the bottom of this, we will need the administrator to answer our questions truthfully and forthrightly about the construction and consolidation of the new FBI headquarters. The plan to acquire the new headquarters for the FBI has a long history. In the 2009 Omnibus Appropriation Bill, Congress directed the GAO to review the security concerns of the J. Edgar Hoover Building and other FBI locations in the National Capital Region. In a report issued in November 2011, GAO found that actions were needed to address concerns with the condition of the FBI headquarters because the building had become dilapidated and the FBI staff had outgrown the building. In addressing the concerns raised about the Hoover Building, GSA and the FBI jointly recognized that consolidating all the FBI personnel in the Hoover Building and other locations throughout the region into one modern facility was the best answer. GSA expected the new headquarters facility would eliminate close to a million square feet in rentable space, significantly reduce the need for FBI lease space in the national capital region, and address the serious security concerns raised by the FBI headquarters being located in downtown DC. In 2014, GSA issued a solicitation to interested developers asking for bids to develop a new FBI campus headquarters, one of three suburban locations in either Maryland or Virginia, that would house 10,000 FBI employees. In 2015, GSA identified a short list of offers and asked for bids for a new FBI campus in exchange the winning bidder would receive the current Hoover building site. On July 11, 2017, GSA canceled a procurement to replace the FBI headquarters and in February of 2018, GSA and FBI presented Congress with a new revised raise and rebuild plan for a new FBI building at the existing Hoover location. This raise and rebuild plan represented abandoning nearly 10 years of work of moving the FBI to a suburban Washington, D.C. campus. In addition, the long-term plan to relocate the FBI headquarters to a suburban location would cost an estimated $3.57 billion, according to the Inspector General and would be offset by $334 million of proceeds from selling the existing Pennsylvania Avenue site. In contrast, the plan to keep the Pennsylvania Avenue property, demolish the existing facility, and construct a new building would cost an estimated $3.84 billion, or $279 million more than the relocation plan, and it would accommodate 2,300 fewer employees. Further, the new revised Raise and Rebuild Plan would make the FBI the only member of the intelligence community to have a new headquarters in an urban site. In testimony to Congress back in 2013, the then Associate De Deputy Director of the FBI stated that although the FBI had implemented some countermeasures at the Hoover Building to improve security, these efforts are not a substitute for relocating FBI headquarters to a location that affords the ability to provide true security in accordance with interagency security committee standards. So what change? Why would a nearly 10-year project agreed upon by both GSA and FBI be abandoned for a significantly more expensive proposal that compromises the safety and security of FBI personnel? Interestingly enough, Many years before becoming president, Donald Trump expressed interest in the FBI headquarters moving out of Washington, D.C. so that he could acquire the land on Pennsylvania Avenue and redevelop the property, which is directly across from Trump International Hotel. However, after he was sworn in as president and became ineligible as a federal employee to obtain the property, he reportedly became dead opposed to the government selling the property. This reversal caused many to question, and rightfully so, whether the President wanted to protect his financial interest in the Trump Hotel 
particularly if another private developer could obtain the property and compete directly with the Trump Hotel. With this in mind, I asked Administrator Murphy last year in a hearing on April 17, 2018, directly and repeatedly if President Trump or other White House officials had any communications with GSA or the FBI about this abrupt and expensive new decision to keep the FBI at the Hoover location. Unfortunately, in Ms. Murphy's response, she withheld the fact that she met twice with White House officials about the FBI project, both on December 20th, 2017, with General Kelly and OMB Director Mike Mick Mulvaney, and on January 24th with the President himself. The GSA Inspector General later described these omissions as having left a misleading impression with our subcommittee that those meetings didn't occur. Ms. Murphy misled us in spite of the fact that according to the GSA Inspector General, she had practiced answering these questions several times while preparing for the hearing. When the Inspector General asked why Administrator Murphy had misled the committee, she replied that she did not want to derail the hearing. Well, let's be clear, we are off the tracks. This committee demands truthful and forthright answers going forward. Today, I take it at face value that Administrator Murphy wants to answer our questions and put last year's hearing behind us, and we would like to do that. We want to know why the relocation plan for the FBI changed dramatically and how it impacts the security of FBI headquarters and what level of White House involvement there was in this decision. We want to know why the new plan is more costly than the previous plan that had been vetted and approved by Congress. We also want the questions answered in the, the follow-up letter from October 18, 2018, where I and other members of Congress requested a complete time, timeline of the FBI project and all documents and communications associated with the FBI relocation. So with that said, I look forward to what will hopefully be an open and truthful discussion today. Thank you. And I defer to the ranking member, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Murphy, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us today. And um, you know, when it comes to our federal government operations, uh, you have a tremendous role. I mean, in essence, you, uh, you operate the agency that is the landlord for all the federal government buildings. I know it's a tremendous task, and you're, you're prepared for this hearing today. Um, but you also act as an acquisition agent uh, in, in many, many respects, uh, whether it's purchasing of services, supplies, equipment for all the agencies. Each year, you manage tens of billions of dollars of hard-earned taxpayer money, and this is a great responsibility, and obviously you're a part of a lot of conversations, a lot of tremendous decisions. Um, but uh, I did want to, uh, you know, from the onset, compliment you and what your agency has done, and in your testimony, you, you've identified, um, I think, about $6 billion of savings that you're presenting before this committee, and that's not something we see often. Uh, from many agencies, so thank you for doing that because our nation faces a, a crisis. I mean, $22 trillion in debt has amassed and uh, the deficit continues to grow. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks can point a lot of fingers, but I appreciate the fact that you're willing to come before us with cost savings measures. Uh, I as well look forward to your testimony today. I am not one that believes that uh, you have joined in colluding with the president or anyone else uh, in, in any kind of manner that would uh, uh, intentionally or knowingly uh, mislead this committee or any other committee. I don't see that in your character and your person. Uh, and, uh, and I wouldn't be one to sit here as well and say my words uh, always come out the way they intended. So today's your, your great opportunity to clarify anything you may have said in the past, and, and, uh, and I, I look forward to your testimony this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Graves. And it's, the record reflect that it's 10.08, and the word collude has entered our uh, lexicon this morning. Uh, I had it in the it might have been implied before 10.08. Uh, uh, well, the word itself, and, and it's just I, I had it in a later pool. I thought it would be more like 10.15. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I can't express enough. I care a lot less about the testimony last time. We'll touch on it. I care a lot more about how this decision was made and I know it's a sensitive topic for you, and I want to give you every opportunity to help us understand. But you have to appreciate the fact that 10 years of planning and work and, and a line that you said that, uh, and I'd like you to address this in your opening. You reportedly stated that the Pennsylvania Avenue location, this is January of 2018, was not GSA's preferred site and a lot of work had gone into the campus concept. So I just want to know why the abrupt change 
and how the apparent cost differentials and safety issues were addressed and who was involved in those decisions. Uh, so uh, we, I want you to take your time. We usually tell folks in the opening, uh, please don't filibuster your, your written statement is, is there for the record. But if it's something new and we can learn from it, take your time and help us understand how we came to that abrupt change. Please go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Quigley, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to join you today. I look forward to discussing a wide range of priorities and programs within GSA, an agency that supports federal agencies with their real estate, procurement, IT, and shared services needs. I'm pleased to say GSA saved the American taxpayer nearly $7 billion in fiscal year 2018 alone. We look forward to building on our service and cost savings success this year and in the future. As the federal government's primary landlord, GSA manages more than 368 million square feet of owned and leased space, housing more than 1 million federal employees. As part of our ongoing efforts to be better stewards of taxpayer dollars, last year GSA's public building service generated more than $1 billion in savings, including over $900 million in cost avoidance from lease transactions through consolidations, footprint reductions, and longer-term leases. From office equipment to satellites, GSA's contracting vehicles help agencies procure $56.7 billion in goods and services annually. By simplifying and streamlining access to the federal marketplace and modernizing procurement systems and processes, GSA helped agencies save nearly $6 billion in 2018. The modernization of federal IT infrastructure and applications is an important priority for GSA, and our agency has become a trusted leader and a valued partner in improving IT across the federal government. By expanding shared services across the federal government, GSA is perform improving performance and saving taxpayer money. This allows agencies to direct more resources towards their core missions. One example of shared service savings, GSA Fleet, provides more than 217,000 vehicles to more than 75 agencies, delivering a savings of 28 cents per mile when compared to independent fleet programs. Before I close, I do want to address the one issue that was discussed last year in the subcommittee and that you addressed in, in your opening remarks, sir, the FBI headquarters project. Given the intense interest in this project, I want to be clear. The FBI made the decision to propose remaining at its current location. The, I, I wish the FBI were here with me today to explain their reasoning for doing so, but there was a new FBI director who joined the agency in August of 2017. And I don't find it at all surprising that a new leader coming in to, to, to run the agency would want to take a step back, given the fact that the procurement had just been canceled, and look at the best way to address the needs that he assessed for his agency moving forward. Last year, I did not mention the president with regard to the location decision, because to my knowledge then and now, the president had no involvement in the FBI's location decision. The FBI's decision to remain at their current location was communicated to GSA at a meeting on January 4th of 2018. Three weeks later, FBI Director Ray, Deputy Attorney General uh, Rosen, uh, Rosenstein, Director Mulvaney, General Kelly, and I met in General Kelly's office and decided to use a demolish rebuild approach to construction at the current site. The location decision had already been made prior to that meeting. Following that meeting, Ray, Rosenstein, Mulvaney, Kelly, and I met with the President to discuss the only outstanding question, how should the project be funded? The FBI has also testified that it made the decision to remain at the current location, and I included a recent written, in my written testimony, a recent statement from the FBI reiterating that it made this decision. Also, after an exhaustive investigation, the GSA IG determined that my testimony, that the FBI made the determination decision to remain at its current location, was true. I, I 
look forward to answering all of your questions on this, uh, this matter this morning. Um, and I also look forward to being able to discuss with you all of the good things that GSA is trying to do to better serve American taxpayers and the federal agencies uh, that it's our core mission to support. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you. Uh, let me begin on the cost issue then. Please. Uh, because as I, as I read the Inspector General report, uh, Director Ray reportedly said, quote, if the cost savings between a suburban campus site and the existing site were similar, his preference was to remain at the Hoover Building. But, quote, if the campus scenario offered significant savings, which we now know it does, he was not opposed to a suburban campus site. Is that your understanding of Director Ray's uh, understanding and belief at the time? Uh, that was, that's the, yes, that is uh, my understanding. I'm sorry, do I, yes, that's my understanding of Director Ray's statement that he was a strong supporter of remaining at the current location, uh, but that if the cost difference were, if it was a wild cost difference, that, that he would reconsider. What's your, what's your definition of wild, and is there a cost difference? So I think the way the IG did her cost analysis is one that I'd like to, if I may, I'd like to explain why GSA disagrees with it. Um, there are a lot of elements that go into any you know, cost buildup, and I'd be happy to provide you with a really detailed briefing. I won't waste your time by going through all of it now. But I think the key issue where we disagreed is how we treat the cost, or the value of the current location. When the IG did her analysis, they subtracted from the cost of a campus the, the money that would be put toward, that, uh, that we would receive from selling the FBI building. Right. They did not give a similar credit, though, to the remaining on the current location. And if you think about it, if you owned a home that was $200,000, and you own it free and clear, and you decide that you want to buy a $300,000 home, just because you can get $200,000 from the sale of your current home doesn't mean that the new home costs 100000 The new home still costs $300,000. It's how you're going to pay for it. But it's the net effect on taxpayers. We're going to get money back one way or another if we sell the Hoover building, correct? Well, again, if you think about the just, analogy just, from the, from the just home. Let me, let me just an but answer that, and I want to give you a chance to respond. We would get money back approximately. What, what's your ballpark guess of what we would get back selling the Hoover building? The GSA has not released that amount because we've wanted to protect that as procurement sensitive information. The IG has stated that they believe that, I, I think you quoted in, right. in your remarks that it, um, that it was 334 million. GSA's concern has all along been that we- It's a pretty good location. Well, we believe the site's worth far more than that. And that because of the cost, uh, because, but we're not getting the full value. Uh, that the, because of the way that the prior lease exchange was structured, where we didn't have the full appropriations, we were going to be taking, it, your $200,000 home was gonna become a, a $50,000 home. And so you weren't going to be recognizing the full value of that first investment you had. So when we look at how much we're actually going to, it's going to cost taxpayers, it was still going to cost taxpayers the same amount to build a campus or to remain, you know, roughly the same amount to build a campus or to remain in the same place. Um, there are you other factors are, that I haven't explained why the money we get for selling it doesn't count. Uh, the money we get for selling it isn't money we can then go and strictly just apply to the new building. And even if it were, it's you know, it's an asset the federal government has then lost. It's a valuable piece of land, as you've acknowledged, and the at the end of the day, if we're talking about a different you know, a a campus that the FBI doesn't believe meets its requirements, All and right. a headquarters facility that the FBI says does meet its requirements. Well, let, me, let me try to get through the cost issues with you. Were you aware that several officials within GSA thought that they were understating the cost associating with the newly revised plan? As the, and this was stated in the Inspector General's report. I, I read that in the Inspector General's report. Um, the information that was provided to me with the funding gap analysis, we've been continuing to dive into the funding uh, issue and look at, among other things, what 
What are the relocation costs of moving employee, the 23 employees, 2,300, I'm sorry, employees the FBI's identified as moving out of the, the area? A yes. Were you aware that there were those in GSA thought that, that, that thought that we were understating the cost of the uh, raise and rebuild project? Not at the time I appeared here last year. Okay, well, are you I aware of those now? I'm aware of them due to the, F to the IG's report, yes. And did any of these... Uh, those who dissented discuss this with the GSA leadership team. Now, at this point, to your knowledge, um, no one, no, they did, they had not discussed it with me. The project team that's been working on it has been working to refine what the costs associated with the project would be. They continue to do so. To your understanding, did this take into consideration? Uh, the hardening of the building and all the other issues that come with being downtown and the only building in the intelligence community that would be in an urban setting. So, yes, the security measures were taken into account. Um, in fact, the numbers that GSA presented in the February 2018 report included the fit-out costs, which is what the Usually what uh, GSA comes to appropriations with in the past to come with is the cost of building the building, not of all the things you have to add on to make it a functional building. And an attempt to be much more transparent as to what the real costs of the building were, we included in the uh, 2018 report what we thought the additional cost would be. And, that, and the issue with the hardening of the building is, in, is indeed the reason that GSA s strongly argued that a remodel of the building would not be a successful project. That we believe that, that demolish and rebuild, if, if the FBI wanted to remain on that site, that demolish and rebuild was the approach that we should use. Is the quote correct that you stood by the, the original plan in Jan, on January 4th of 2018? It was not the preferred site and that a lot of work had gone into the campus concept, you said this? So when I met with, uh, with Director Ray on on January 4th of 2018, I presented him with each of the options, including what we understood at the time was his new preference. I had spoke, I had a telephone conversation with Director Ray on the 22nd of December of 2017, um, at which time he told me that he wanted to remain at the current location, and I asked for the ability to come over and brief him on, on what that would mean in the alternatives. My concern for, was that by switching from a campus to an urban lo to remaining at the current location, we would have a lot of trouble getting funding. That we would have trouble having support from our appropriators. What, what did you and view then? What was your argument on what the other downsides were besides this? The fact that there were the capacity for 2,300 fewer employees that were going to have to be housed someplace else, additional security requirements downtown, all the arguments you made in this 10-year plan that that uh, that Congress approved to move forward. You must have made some of those arguments with the director. So when I met with the director, the decision had already made, been made by the FBI, independently of GSA, that it, it was going to reorganize its headquarters structure and move 2,300 employees outside of the national capital region. So that those employees were already off the table as far as the director was concerned. And did the director tell you who he had talked to about this with the White House? No. Did you ask him? No. Did anyone ever tell you whether the White House communicated with the director about their preferences as to this site? I want to be careful in answering this question, sir, because I know that there have been uh, questions about this in the past. I mean, it's long-standing executive branch practice and privilege not to discuss conversations between the president and his advisors, between senior advi uh, heads of agencies and senior White House advisors. So I, I, I'm going to respectfully decline to answer that question. Well, are you exerting a privilege? I'm not exerting a privilege because the privilege belongs to the White House. I'm saying that longstanding and, and, and all my predecessors would, of either party would have declined to have a conversation about uh, conversations that I wasn't even a party to that may or may not have occurred. Well, I, I'm going to – we'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'll pass on to Mr. Graves. The, the fact of the matter is the president has not asserted this privilege, correct? To the best of my knowledge, no. Well, he would have had to have told yes. you. It's his it, privilege. It's his privilege. Uh, no. So you're asserting a privilege that has the president hasn't. I, I am not asserting a privilege. I'm declining to answer based on the fact that, first of all, you're asking me to speculate about conversations I wasn't part of. I'm asking to. you if you're aware of any. And 
going either way, either answering yes or no to that question would reveal what conversations took place between agency heads and the president. And it's my understanding that long-standing executive branch policy and practices, we just don't discuss conversations between the heads of the agency, the president, and senior White House advisors. And respectfully, I'm asking you to answer because there has been no assertion of privilege. And respectfully, I'm going to decline, sir. Uh, we'll get on to that, but I'll let Mr. Graves continue. Hey, Mr. Chairman, and um, I, I, I can sense the difficulty in her uh, with this question because you're asking her to answer a question based on a conversation that could be hearsay that maybe she heard about or didn't hear about or others talked about. And look, in this place, in this city, Mr. Chairman, you know there's a lot of conversations that people think they heard or didn't hear or others presume might have been said. In fact, you are implying that yourself. Um, Ms. Murphy, it sounds to me like with the, the chairman's questioning a little bit, he accepts your initial uh, opening statement about the, the previous uh, hearing we had and how you, you clarified that, uh, unless, unless he, you know, says something different here a little bit later. So thank you for doing that. Tell me about how decisions are made. I mean, is it, is it common practice that you, as the head of GSA, tell directors or presidents or agency heads where they will have a building built or not built. Is that your job? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Usually what GSA does is an agency comes to us and they say, we have a requirement. And they give us that requirement. And then GSA works with them to find a suitable approach. And then we present what we think the answer to that is to our oversight committees. Um, and they then have the ability to, to pass resolutions either agreeing with us or disagreeing with us. So, the, so it's common that you receive a preference we receive from a requirement. those that are doing their own research and have their own requests. So. Yes, and, the, and I'll be candid. I don't believe that the GSA administrator gets to dictate to the FBI director what national security requirements are. Do you know of any time in which a, a GSA director, whether yourself or in the past, is ever told another director no and just said you're wrong we're not going to do that we I, I have argued with other directors about whether I agree with their delineated area whether I agree with their requirements whether I think we can sharpen our pencils but I, I have never told them no absolutely no you may not you know aware of anyone in the past that has that has done that I, I, I can't think of one where there's been that conflict where FBI or, or anyone comes forward or DOT recently within the last decade, you know, said we need a new facility and this is where we need and this is how much we need and how we need it and where we need it. And a director say, no, we're not going to do that for you. I can't think of any time that I have done that, but I, I, I don't want to speculate as to what my predecessors have done. I'm not aware of any such. Well, that's fine. I can't any, so let's, I don't let's wanna, go back in time. I've learned not to started. speculate at all. I, I, um, I think the chairman referenced this is about a 10 year process we've all been in. Uh, more than, yes. More than 10. Yes. Uh, you, you've been with GSA for a while too, in some capacity yes. uh, here and there. So, um, so maybe you've heard conversations in the past uh, where all this initiated and, and where it came from. Um, so it initiated maybe in 2004, 5, 6, 7. When did it all start? Let's just. Let's go so back to the it, beginning. It for was a back, yeah, you know, uh, beginning of the prior decade, where the FBI was coming and saying that they're they, that the so building in, is falling down. And right. if I can give you an example, but then investment in in site research began when you think maybe two thousand seven, eight. I think it was two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. They they began doing the work on that. In two thousand nine, there was a GAO study. There was another study in two thousand eleven. There's it's there's been a lot of work. That's when were the sites this. identified? The suburban sites. Uh, the uh, suburban sites were identified in I I, I believe it was about twenty fourteen mm -hmm. uh, that they, the final three were identified. There were more before prior to that. Um, if, if, if I'm not exactly correct on the sure. data, I'd love to correct just, it just afterwards. Asking generally, yes, trying yes. to help the committee with yes. the timeline of this. This yeah. is not something that happened last year that no. uh, all of a sudden you've stepped in and told the president or anyone else or the president's told you or someone where all this is going. Uh, so the sites were narrowed down to three. Is that my understanding? That's correct, Is yes. it s still three suburban sites or has it been narrowed down any further aside from the recommendation from the FBI director? So the... Uh, when the procurement was canceled in, in July of 2017, which was before I became the administrator, right. 
at that point in time, GSA did not pursue keeping its options on those sites. Mm -hmm. So okay. we, Let's at this back point to in time, those three yeah. sites. Okay. Where, where were those sites? There were two in Maryland and one in Virginia. And were there any one preferred over another from the previous administration? Um, I don't know if the previous administration had a preferred site. Um, I believe it would be inappropriate for me to have a preference as to mm -hmm. if there's going to be a competition, the competition runs itself. The two and the GSA, admi were, the GSA what, administrator should be ambivalent as to what the outcome is. Are you aware of any conversations prior to you being in this position to where political influence was asserted and, and preferences were indicated from Congress? Um, yes. The, uh, I, I'm aware that both the Maryland and Virginia delegations have, st I have a strong vested interest in <laughs> And, and having the, uh, the two the Maryland in their, sites in their so states, yes. If we were to look at a congressional map, where would those two Maryland sites be? Whose congressional district would those be in? Um, the maybe Stinney Hoyers. Yes, oh, yes, that would okay. be one of them. And uh, the yeah, the Virginia site would be so in Mr. Connolly. Both so, yeah. Maryland sites could be Stinney Hoyers. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they would be. So if I remember right, they, Steny Hoyer was a majority leader back in 2009 and 10. Barack Obama was president. They had Department of Justice. They're back at it again now, and Steny Hoyer's the majority leader again. Is it possible there's some political influence on the other side? I, I would never want to impugn the motives. I am sure that every member of Congress is doing what he or she believes is best for his constituents, the American people, just right. as I'm trying to do what I believe is best. Yeah, so my customer agencies and the American and, people. And you're, you're so right to do that. I mean, you're being fair here. Maybe I'm not. Maybe the chairman's not on his, his implications mm -hmm. as well. But we could all probably go back and ask for some, you know, some, some research to be done to see if there were any emails or any phone calls or any pressure by leadership offices of this body on GSA in the past. That might make an interesting... Uh, investigative report as well. So, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's, it can cut both ways, I think. But it would be nice to move forward and allow this committee to accept the fact that on February 8th, a letter was directed to Ms. Murphy that says, after careful consideration, the FBI decided that demolishing and rebuilding the Pennsylvania Avenue facility best balance the equities at stake for the organization. So it was their request. It was not Ms. Murphy's conversation with anyone other than being given this recommendation by the FBI themselves. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back to the next round. I won't ask you if Steny Hoyer owns any property across from the FBI building or in Maryland, but it's more direct influence. And I will reference that when the IG report was released, August 27, 2018, the FBI had not completed the security program of requirements for raise and rebuild. So, uh, but, and, and we'll talk about privilege again in a second, but uh, for now, Mr. Bishop. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I am troubled uh, by what appears to be a lack of regard for the findings and the determination of the Inspector General of your department as administrator, um, a neighbor to the FBI building is the Trump International Hotel, Washington on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is housed in the old post office building on a 60-year lease from GSA. Uh, of course, the lease contains a provision that says no U.S. official should be admitted to any share or part of this lease or to any benefit that may arise therefrom. In March of 2017, um, GSA uh, made a determination that the presidency, that Trump's presidency uh, does not present a conflict of interest to the lease. But then on January 16th of 2019, uh, the GSA Office of Inspector General uh, released a report finding that 
the President's business interests in the old post office raised issues under the Constitution's emoluments clauses that might cause a breach of the lease. But he decided at that time not to address those issues in connection with management of the lease, which is your responsibility. Then uh, the GSA Inspector General advised you and GSA to reconsider the constitutional issues presented by the OPO lease agreement, and if a violation was found, to reconsider your earlier finding that the president, that President Trump had not violated the lease agreement. The monuments clause issues, uh, of course, that's under litigation in federal mm -hmm. court. But it appears to me that uh, the recommendations of the Inspector General don't carry very much weight uh, with uh, you as administrator and the folks at uh, GSA. Can you tell me why that is the case? When most agencies uh, uh, have a great deal of uh, deference uh, to the recommendations of uh, the Inspector General. But in this instance, uh, it appears that uh, you don't have very much regard for that. Uh, and I might note that uh, this is uh, a neighbor piece of property to the FBI building that has been the subject of discussion uh, for most of this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. I, I appreciate the question because I think there's been a great deal of confusion as to the January 2019 IG report and what the actual recommendation is. If I may, I, I'd like to read the recommendation to you. It says that we recommend that before continuing to use the language, meaning the language, the clause that's in the lease, GSA determine the purpose of the interested parties provision, conduct a formal legal review by the Office of General Counsel that includes consideration of the foreign and presidential emolument clauses, and revise that language to avoid ambiguity. The GSA accepted that recommendation. I would say that the, the entire report, the only recommendation the Inspector General's office gave to GSA was about the prospective use of a clause in at leases. They did not recommend that GSA make any changes to its current administration of the, the lease for the old post office building. Did you, or did GSA um, consult with the Attorney General uh, with regard to legal advice on that? So uh, the did, did you have, um, the Inspector General obviously uh, had uh, a strong suggestion for you, but uh, did you seek other legal counsel to get a contrary opinion? So the decision to not consult by the, with, the attorney, with the Department of Justice before issuing a, the, um, the contracting officer's letter in March of 2017 was actually made by the prior administration in December of 2016. That was two years before I was, uh, I'm sorry, it was a year before I was confirmed. GSA has been, and the, as you know, the topic of the emoluments clause is the subject of litigation. The Department of Justice has in public pleadings at this time said that there is not an emolument. Let me just interrupt you. My time is about to expire, but didn't the IG report criticize your leadership at GSA for improperly ignoring the constitutional issues there? Uh, they were criticizing the decision to not consult with the Department of Justice. That decision was made by the prior administration. So the answer to my question is yes? They criticized the, the agency's decision, but it was the decision made by the prior administration. Okay, my time has expired. My friend, Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Chairman Quigley. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Administrator Murphy. Good morning, sir. Let's, let's get down to brass tacks. Was the President involved in the selection of the location for the F new FBI headquarters? To the best of my knowledge, he was not involved in the decision for the location. Did the Trump Hotel influence the decision not to move the FBI headquarters from its current location? No. To the best of my knowledge, there was no co discussion of the Trump Hotel involved in the decision to out on the location. Does, did the IG report on the FBI headquarter location dispute your testimony last year that the FBI made the decision to remain on Pennsylvania Avenue? No, no sir, it didn't. What was the January 24th meeting in the Oval Office about? 
It was about how we were going to fund the, the FBI, the demolished rebuild of the FBI location. And it was an important meeting for GSA because we were proposing a ground lease leaseback. The ground lease leaseback has been a matter of controversy, or I shouldn't say controversy, of debate between the Office of Management and Budget and GSA for many administrations now. And the idea that we were going to be able to use a ground lease leaseback to expedite construction was one that was actually very exciting for GSA. The current status of the FBI headquarters, uh, good condition, poor condition, fair condition? Uh, sir, to answer your question, last month an eight pound block of concrete fell through the ceiling onto an employee's desk. If he'd been, it took out the overhead lamp, his phone, part of his monitor. If he'd been sitting there, uh, he would have been seriously injured if not killed. We now have to wall off parts of the building. I would invite any member of the committee to join me. Uh, I'm sure the FBI would be happy to have everyone come over there and see not just the state of the current building, but also talk about what our plans are for the future. Uh, is it normal for you to tell the uh, political appointees, such as uh, uh, Director Ray, where they should go and what they should do? Or do you act with them in concert? Or how, how does that procedure work where you, when you're dealing with administrators as far as uh, where they want to m maintain their headquarters? So GSA works with agencies. Agencies give us the program of requirements, and the agencies own that program of requirements. GSA then works with them on a solution that will meet that requirement. GSA has opinions, and we try to influence the decision, but ultimately, you know, we are going to, you know, it's, especially when it's a matter of national security, we're going to defer to the FBI director. This wouldn't be your normal office building maintaining government employees. There's a, a certain level of security necessary that's already in place for the FBI headquarters where it is? There is security that is already in place, and the ability to do a demolish rebuild lets us put a lot of very new cutting-edge security features in as well. How old is the building? The building was built, it's, I think it's 51 years old now, sir. What's the normal lifespan for a building? Uh, a governmental building. Now, granted, the, the capital's a, a different structure, but, you know, uh, something that would take it back to, what, in the early 80s it was built? Uh, no, so it was built in the late 60s. Oh. Um, so it, it, it's a, a brutalist structure. Um, the average age of the GSA-owned portfolio is 50 years, so about half of our buildings are older than 50 years and half are newer than 50 years. Do you do a, a benefit cost analysis on the uh, moving of an agency versus re rebuilding at the on site? Uh, yes, sir, we do. And the uh, by the idea of renovating or on site, really, just we were concerned that that was going to that the operational risks to the FBI were going to be so high, as well as the risks to the construction project by moving them out um, and then demolishing, rebuilding, we could get them the headquarters they need for the 8,300 employees who are going to remain in the area. Now, we've gone through the similar cost analysis with the uh, Smithsonian Institute and the Air, Air, Air and Space Museum, correct? Uh, well, the Smithsonian is independent of GSA. I, I would assume that the individuals who are working on the Smithsonian project have done that, that work. Well, uh, I, I apologize for that. I thought you were a party to the discussion because it, my understanding of tear down, rebuild, there's a billion dollars? Uh, that's my understanding, but it, the Smithsonian has some independence from GSA, so they're uh, it's still billion dollars of taxpayer money. Still, that's it's still billion wondering. dollars, but it's yes. It, yes. And that was a fairly new building, is as, as, as similar to again when so. we talk about the Capitol or the other buildings that we're in here are yeah. are older, but they have stronger bones, for lack of a better term. I'd say the GSA headquarters building, for example, is 101 years old now, and it, it, it needs some work. I um, but. It's got really good bones, and so we, we're actually able to, we're adding another 1,000 employees to the building this year, uh, so we will be able to really maximize the utilization of it, because it's, got, it's a very solid building. Um, it's one of the reasons that last year's budget request, I asked for a lot of money, funds for repair and alteration work, because I think that if we invest in these buildings and keep them in good shape, we don't end up ha having to have conversations about do we demolish the building or do we sell it and need to build a new building. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. And before I recognize uh, Mr. Christ, just as you go forward with your testimony, Madam, you're, you're, you openly discussed and characterized the January 
2018 White House meeting, including the one with the President, and uh, in your other answers with my Republican colleagues, you seem to be uh, selectively asserting uh, a privilege that you aren't asserting. So uh, let's hope we can be a little more consistent. Mr. Christ. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, Administrator. It's nice to have you with us. Thank you, sir. Um, in 2014, the Government Services Administration began procurement proceedings for a new FBI campus outside of Washington, uh, citing the clear financial benefits of a suburban location. Is that accurate to you? It is, sir, yes. Um, at some point between now and then, the GSA scrapped the relocate plan, relocate plan in favor of a more expensive plan to raise J. Edgar Hoover Building and build a new headquarters on the existing site. You have said that the wishes of the FBI director were part of that decision-making process. Um, did he share with you why um, he wanted to do something that was more expensive? Uh Sir, it, and I, I really wish the FBI director were here with me to answer these questions because I think he could do the best job of answering, you know, what his requirements are. But yes, he, we talked about his need to have proximity to his parent organization. So you know, the FBI is part of the Department of Justice. There, there, the fact that there are infrastructure concerns um, that will make it easier for their employees it will also make it easier for them to secure, to have some, you know, whether it be plumbing. Um, electricity, that there's a lot of the, the work is already in place. They talked about the number of meetings that they have in the area and the transportation costs and the increased cost of the FBI of being there. But additionally- is there less traffic outside the district and coming into it? Well, I think that their issue would be that they will still have a large number of meetings in the district, and so their employees would be constantly commuting between a campus and, um, and their uh, whoever it is they were meeting with. The Overall concern, though, sir, was that the again it was a brand new director in August of 2017. So the prior procurement was without full appropriations was not financially viable. By the end, it was clear by the end of July of 2017 that it just was not a viable procurement anymore. But under under a previous director, under um, yes, this mission was put into motion to have this relocation to go outside the district. Mm -hmm. um, do you know who that director was? Um, I would I would believe that it would have been I believe it would have been Director Comey, but I'm, I'm I, I it was Mueller. Mueller, sorry, Mueller, sorry. I believe yeah. so. Yes. Um, in, in weighing the pros and the cons of the two options, relocate or raise and rebuild, I'd like to know what changed in the almost 10 year run up to the plan of relocation, um, either by you or by the new director. Uh, in addition to what you may have already just stated, uh, that made it more attractive to stay on Pennsylvania Avenue? So the, the first thing that made it more attractive was that the FBI's requirement itself changed. They no longer needed a campus for 10,600 employees. They needed a building for 8,300 employees. The FBI's decision, which was independent of GSA, and I believe has already obtained independent funding, to relocate 2,300 of their employees changed the calculus. It put the site on Pennsylvania Avenue back in play. Uh, so when when GSA was informed of that, that brought the an owned site back into contention. So smaller but more expensive was deemed better. Well, they're they're just they are different mission needs. So the uh, the when the FBI though is saying that the you know, having a building there that they could accommodate their employees in, it wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't need the space for a parking garage. You wouldn't need a separate physical plant. So I mean, it's smaller, but it's because you don't need those other things you would need with a campus. Um, did you have at any time any knowledge of the president's preference of which of the two plans uh, he preferred? Uh, so. I, I want to be clear on the, the, you're asking me if I had knowledge of whether the president had a pref preference. A pre preference on so we look, uh, sir, again, I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to speculate and I don't want to, I'm not please asking don't, for we, don't read a yes or a no into this, but I'm going to decline to discuss conversations that I may or may not have had with the president or his advisors. Um, Why? It's longstanding executive branch practice and privileges for heads of agencies not to discuss those, but whether they existed or didn't exist. Chairman, nobody's asserted a privilege. No one has asserted a privilege, sir, but that's, 
In the same way with attorney-client privilege, it's the client who asserts the privilege, not the attorney. Um, it, it, wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be me who asserts the privilege. It would be the White House, and I don't get to make the decision for the White House. So you were in uh, two meetings with the chief of staff of the president and the president and the FBI director on this issue? So prior to <coughs> the hearing last year, I'd been in one meeting with the president on this issue. And you said that was on cost? And that was on cost. No, no discussion of the location of the facility? Uh, I'm authorized to discuss what we decided in that meeting. And so I, I and Did the, you decide the, in that meeting the, the location? No. The, the location had already been decided weeks before I met with the president. And by that was whom? the first time I'd ever by, met the president. By whom? The, by the FBI. I think my time's expired. Thank you. I just want to ask, you were authorized you just answered the question. You were authorized to, by by, who? Normally, that I wouldn't. It would be. But who authorized you? Uh, White House Counsel's Office said that I could discuss the fact the meetings existed and what the conclusions were. The right. I. Well, 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 I'm sorry. We'll get in that. Okay. I don't want to delay, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Chairman, if I could just certainly, uh, sir, clarify to to. Uh, I believe her answer was correct on the FBI director at the time, uh, Mr. Christ. It, Comey took over in 13, uh, and uh, Mueller was prior to 13, 13 and prior. So just for clarification of the record, I don't know. Uh, well, we'll put in the record, record eventually who was the FBI director at each point in this uh, long process, but uh, I don't want to delay and, Mr. Stewart. And maybe who was president at the time in conversations that took place between then GSA director. Those would all those, be interesting, too, yes. if someone could answer. And the majority leader. I appreciate that. Ms. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Administrator Murphy, thank you. We've had a chance to get to know you in your tenure, and I want you to know that many of us think you're doing a terrific job. It's a difficult position, uh, and you had some th stuff thrown on your lap that I don't think was in, in you didn't expect. But uh, And I think we've, to use a phrase, beat this dead horse in this hearing today, and I haven't been here for all of it, but I've been here for enough to get a sense of where it's gone. So I want to ask a few clarifying questions and then move on to something that's important to me and my district, which matters as well, um, and allow you to respond if you could. And just for clarity, for my own benefit, I understand that career, and I'll emphasize, career contracting officials determined that the tenant of the old post office building lease is in compliance with the terms of that lease. Is that true? That is correct, sir. And do you believe that these decisions should be made by career Nonpartisan, non-political, hopefully unbiased professionals, which is what we're counting on them to be, and which I think they take pride in being, that they would be the ones who would determine that uh, versus elected officials or political appointees. Uh, yes, sir, I do. And to a sensitive subject, but some have questioned your intentions or perhaps the accuracy of your words or testimony for this committee or Congress, I'll give you a chance to answer very, very simply. Have you been truthful in your testimony? Yes, sir, I have. And have. Have you tried to mislead in any way? No, it was never my intention. And I believe and I that. Don't believe I, I don't believe I did. But I, I don't believe you did either. And if I could make an uh, extended argument here, and that is it's important to keep in mind that when we make accusations or perhaps insinuate, as we have seen, and not in your case, I'm not talking about you or this committee at all now, I'm talking about more generally, well, we have seen innocent people accused of essentially treason over the last few years. We're not accusing them of jaywalking. Innocent people have been accused of treason and other high crimes with no evidence. And it's had an enormous impact on their lives. It has broken them financially. It has ruined their reputations. It has broken, in many cases, their professional careers and their families. And I think it's important that when we make accusations like that or when we imply things such as that, to remember we're talking about real people who many of them are serving honorably and trying to do a good job and that it has impacts on them personally. And it would per perhaps make us careful in, in how, we, uh, how we respond to them or how we, uh, how we treat the information that may be before us. Now, if I could talk to you a little bit about some things back home. We have some real needs in Salt Lake City, as you know. I know you're coming out in a few weeks. We hope to visit with you while you're there. Look forward to it, sir. Uh, in, our, in our courthouses and, and others. 
Uh, we've had several earthquakes in my district over the last few weeks. Um, a renovation of this beautiful courthouse, a historic courthouse, which is a beautiful building, but it's going to be incredibly expensive to bring up to code for earthquake standards. Can you give us your feeling on that and what's the best way forward? So I, you're referring to the Moss Courthouse, sir? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. Um, it, so my understanding is it currently houses the tax and the bankruptcy courts and that it is the top priority, it is the, you know, what we consider to be the highest seismic risk. Um, GSA you know, is going to treat it accordingly. We would need to, in order to, uh, to renovate that building, we would need to move the, uh, during the renovations the, the judges and the courts out into the federal building and into the new courthouse uh, temporarily until we can complete remediation. Uh, I, I don't have an exact date of when we would be able to begin our remediation, but I'd like to work with you on that okay. um, well, so that we can we, try and find a way to fund and, and, and get that to happen. And we, we look forward to that, and thank you. It's a boatload of money, to use a it technical is. term. It is indeed. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost as much as building the new courthouse was out there, which we just completed, and we appreciate your help on that. And then one thing I'll mention quickly, and then we're going to have to work with you, Ms. Ms. Murphy, on this, and that is uh, our... Our judicial, our courts have already outgrown the courthouse. There's a floor there that's been set aside. The sixth floor has been set aside for non-federal uh, offices. And uh, we, we need to work with you to try to clear up some space for our, uh, for our judges out there right now that some of them are, well, all of them are doubling up on their, on their courtrooms and it's been a, a real issue. And we'll reach out to you and, and try to work with you on that conflict as well. I look forward to working with you on it, sir. And thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thanks for being with us, uh, Administrator Murphy. I want to uh, clarify some of your testimony. Uh, I believe you've testified that um, uh, you've spoken to the Office of White House Counsel about today's testimony. Is that correct? Um, I, I, rece I received clarification going into when I met with the IG last year that I could speak to meetings I had and the conclusions of those meetings. No, no, I'm <clears> asking you a simple question. Have you spoken to the Office of White House Counsel prior to today's testimony about today's testimony? If the answer is no, that's fine. Um, I, I want to be careful again, sir, because I, it's my understanding that it's long-standing executive branch policy and practice to not discuss what we do deliberatively to, to prepare for a hearing. Certainly. Um, but you, but we're, we're talking but, about a privilege not to disclose the contents of conversations or communications. I'm simply asking you yes or no. Have there been communications between you and Office of White House Counsel to prepare for today's testimony? Again, I think I'm going to respectfully decline to answer that question because of the, the, the deliberative nature. Okay. Well, uh, let's delve into that a little bit. Uh, when you say you're declining, uh, you're, I think you said before that you're declining uh, uh, on the basis of a potential executive privilege being invoked. Am I correct in that? Yeah, and sir, I am a government contracts lawyer, not a constitutional scholar, but yes, it's my, it's my understanding that no matter the party, no matter the administration, that witnesses don't discuss that what they did to prepare and that heads of agencies don't discuss what they conversations they had uh, the, the details of conversations they had with the president or a senior advisor. I'm asking you a simple question has anybody at the White House including White House counsel instructed you uh, that they are invoking executive privilege in any part of your testimony today? No. Okay, so we're talking about a theoretical invocation of executive privilege here and, and I suppose this is your idea that that may happen. There may be an, uh, an invocation of executive privilege from the White House. Is that what it's about? I'm not speculating as to whether there could be or couldn't be, or would be or wouldn't be. I'm saying that just historically, it, no administrator, no secretary, no head of an agency uh, discusses the contents of conversations with, that they had or didn't have with the president or his senior advisors. You're not only declining to discuss the content of conversations with the White House, you're declining to tell us whether you even had any conversations with the White House prior to today's testimony to get you ready for today's testimony. Am I correct in that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, but you have said that you have not been instructed that there, there is an invocation of exec executive privilege. You did tell us that, correct? correct? Yes. 
Okay. What about the April 17, 2018 testimony that you gave us? Uh, same set of questions, Administrator Murphy. Um, did you have meetings with the White House to get you ready for the April 17, 2018 testimony? Uh, sir, again, I want to decline to answer that question for the same, same reasons that and same, same follow-up question. Are you declining on the basis of an executive privilege that someone actually invoked? Uh, I'm declining because it's both deliberative and, it, it, um, and that, you know, historically, I think that the Department of Justice has stated that we just don't discuss mm -hmm. how we prepare for hearings. And to be precise, uh, again, the same question. Prior to the April 17, 2018 testimony that you gave us, um, did anybody at the White House, in, White House instruct you that they were invoking executive privilege with respect to any of that testimony, April 17, 2018? No, and I hope that when I'm declining to answer these questions, please don't read a yes or a no into that answer. It really is that it's just not mine to discuss. But it's a no for that question. Um, and so, uh, uh, so the April 17, 2018 testimony, uh, 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 if there were any uh, refusals to answer based on executive privilege, uh, again, this was a theoretical executive privilege invocation as opposed to uh, a, a real one. Am I correct in that? I, I, I'm trying to make the distinction between theoretical and real because, again, it's, it's not my privilege. It's I, the, I don't remember. Did you decline to answer any of our questions April 17, 2018? No, sir. I didn't believe that there were any questions that I needed to decline to answer. Okay. Uh, I didn't understand the question to be, I understood the questions that I was being asked to be about the location decision. All right. But you're standing on your refusal to answer our question about whether you met with anybody from White House counsel or anybody from the White House to prepare you for today's testimony, are you? I am. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Torres. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for um, holding this hearing. And thank you uh, for coming to my office, um, couple, I don't know, last month or so. I, as a new member of this committee, I really appreciate having that time with you. And, and as I stated to you during that meeting, um, I'm never going to do a surprise question to you. Um, I was very clear as to the issues that are important to me and what I was going to address at today's hearing. Um, so having said that, I want to ask you if it's common practice for GSA to not sign agreements. No. Okay. So you are so aware. I hope it is not. <laughs> I'm not aware that it is. I, I would okay. be very upset to learn that it was. Okay, great. I'm happy to hear that. Um, this um, GSA agreement with the Park um, Service um, about the post office, when was that um, signed? So, I, so it, can I, may I give a, uh, some background on this? Mm -hmm. I think you're asking me, and I want to be clear because I learned last time that I need to be really clear that I understand what the question is. Um, you're asking me about the clock tower at the old post office yes. and GSA's agreement with the National Park Service uh, to maintain that. So there was a public law, it's, I believe 98-1, that was enacted in, in 1983 that requires GSA to work with the National Park Service to make sure that the, the clock tower remains available. Uh, GSA pays for that as a service contract to the National Park Service. My question was, only about the date. When did GSA sign this contract? Um, I believe it's. I believe their latest. It's an MOU. I believe it was signed um, in late December of 20, 2018. During the shutdown. Yes. Um, during the same shutdown, where um, many national parks across the U.S. were completely destroyed. Um, when I met with you, I expressed my frustration over Joshua Tree in California. That park is a national treasure. It will never recover. Never, never, never recover. It was incredibly irresponsible decision to keep that open. I understand that's not your decision. Um, but you, I'm sure you can imagine how I feel and how my constituents feel 
um, that when they realize that while there was no staff there to guard those 300-year-old Joshua trees, there were staff at the clock tower at the Trump Hotel to ensure that the visitors um, of that hotel had a nice place to visit. So, Congressman, I, I, and I understand your concern with this. Um, GSA, during the, the entire month of December, did not furlough any of its public building service employees. We never furloughed any of our general counsel staff. The, so the decision to continue to, and we funded all of our service contracts throughout the entire shutdown. Uh, there were none that, that we did not pay, so we continued to execute and pay those contracts. GSA noticed that the clock tower had been shut down. It's my understanding that my regional office then reached out to the National Park Service and said GSA was still paying its service contracts and still, so still could pay its service contracts. Um, and th there was no interference either from political appointees, there was no interference from the White House, there was no interference from the, the to my best knowledge, no one from the Trump Hotel even so reached out. So why was there a failure from Lisa uh, Mendelson to date this contract? Why did she fail to date this contract? I, I, I couldn't tell you, ma'am. Um, I'm happy to go back and find out you know, and ask why it wasn't dated. I wasn't aware it wasn't dated until you just mentioned that to me. I would like for you to follow up with me. I'd be happy to. On that um, as well. If it's common practice and if it's not common practice, um, how do you resolve this issue moving forward to ensure that all employees that are um, allowed to sign agreements or contracts, mm -hmm. follow the direction and the policy in place? Uh, Ma'am, that's something I take really seriously. When I was at GSA the first time, I instituted a set of procurement management reviews where we have individuals go out and review contract files throughout the course of the year to make sure that everyone is following the appropriate rules. Um, and I'm going to continue. I, I'm happy to look into this because I take very seriously that we need to keep our records in proper Thank order. Thank you. I yield back, and I'm going to leave this with the clerk so you can have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's let's do a, a round two if we can. It's been discussed in this uh, hearing that uh, you had discussions with uh, Director Ray about this, and it's normal that when you're dealing with an agency that you, uh, you talk with the agency head uh, about their needs and uh, what they need in, out of a facility like this, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. because I, and I read this, November 2011, GAO and the FBI worked together on this report, uh, and they talked about moving to a suburban campus because they raised concerns about the Hoover Building, and they, rec they jointly recognized that consolidating all the FBI and the Hoover Building and other locations throughout the, into one facility was the best answer. The GSA expected the new headquarters facility would eliminate close to a million square feet in rentable space, significantly reduce the need for FBI for lease space, and address the security, serious security concerns raised by FBI headquarters being located in downtown DC. And they would have they wouldn't have to find a home for 2,300 other employees someplace else. And it's been our analysis in talking with the FBI and being a member of the Intelligence uh, Committee that the number of FBI personnel hasn't gone down. It's gone up. So this building's only lasted 51 years, and we get it. It's, a, it's falling apart. But what we're talking about is hopefully building something that'll last longer than 50 years, and we would imagine that the FBI's concerns about our national security would not dictate having fewer employees. So at what point did anyone suggest to you what was wrong and what has changed since 2011 that makes a down lo downtown location safer, a need to galvanize that building, secure it, find home for more and more employees? Did anyone express to you, as you defended this, in early January 2018, why this was incorrect? So my first conversation with the director was the 22nd of, of December of 2017. We did a quick conversation. We agreed that we would have that meeting. That was, uh, my understanding though is that in October and November of 2018, uh, of, I'm sorry, of 2017, before I was confirmed and uh, I wasn't party to these conversations, that there was some career level 
conversation about maybe they wanted to put the J. Edgar Hoover site back into play. Um, GSA, when I met with the, with the director, he had already made the decision that the 2,300 employees were not going to be part, at least my understanding was that the decision was made that the 2,300 employees were no longer part of the requirement. Um, after that meeting, GSA's efforts pivoted into how do we address the requirement, you know, if their new requirement is to stay at this location, how do we address that requirement? So they come back and they, they believed that, and then I think a contract with an outside company to look at how could we address security measures, how could we, um, how could we address the very issues that you're and mentioning, I, I and they've done that independently of GSA. And I just want to ask, these 2,300 are going someplace, and, and included in the cost has to be wherever the heck they're going, the fact that there has to be a chair for them and a desk for them someplace else. Was that included in this when you were calculating which one of these things was most more efficient? Um, it was not included in the numbers that we submitted in January of 2018. I'm sorry, in February of 2018. Or, or the fact that they'll have more employees as time goes on. Um, the we came. The FBI came to us with what their requirement was, and again, as I've stated, the, it's the FBI that tells us what the requirement is going to be. So the you know, the FBI's plan to grow, they believe that they could achieve the consolidation, they could achieve the safety concerns, and that they no longer had the need for ten thousand six hundred empl headquarters employees in the D.C. area. My understanding is they've actually obtained most of the funding independently of GSA to move those employees already. But as you said, with the money we would get from a sale, the dollars count in some place. They're not getting it from some other government. In the end, the money we would get from the sale is U.S. taxpayer dollars. And the money that they get from someplace else is still U.S. taxpayer dollars. So if we're comparing the cost of which is more efficient, in the end, it, it doesn't matter at all where the spigot is. What matters is the total net differential. Although at that time, we were our when the FBI came back to us and said the requirement was 8,300, GSA was not going to build a campus for 10,600 employees if the FBI had already moved, was already moving to 2,300 of those employees. So at that point in time, that, it, it was, that money was going to be spent with whether we did a suburban campus or we remained on Pennsylvania Avenue. Bottom line, why did you defend this in January, early January of 2018? Why did you defend the suburban campus? Honestly, Congressman, I believe that the best way to get funding for this project was a suburban campus, that it was going to be the one that it would be easiest to get support from the Maryland and Virginia delegations to go forward and get funding for. But you got this job for a reason. You're a numbers person. You calculate all this. That had to be calculated in some of your reasoning. It couldn't have been just this is the easiest way for us to get the money. No, it, it was. There, there were, had to be some other factors that you, a smart person, would have weighed and said, this makes more sense. And it can't, it, please don't tell me all your decisions are politi politically expedient. It's not a political expediency question. So beyond that, why, why is suburban location in January? So when I went in toward the FBI building, I w was incredibly upset to see the, the conditions under which those employees are working. They, there are nets outside the building to make sure the pieces of the facade don't fall and injure or kill the employees coming to work, pedestrians walking by. Inside the building, they brought out a media cart filled with pipes that uh, had rusted through. There are parts of the basement that had collapsed, the parking garage that had collapsed. My primary concern is getting the FBI a headquarters that meets its requirements. If, I, if the way to get that done, and what I believe the fastest path to getting them a headquarters uh, in Jan on January 4th, I believed was going to a campus. The FBI then told me that that no longer met their needs. At that point in time, that, that takes that off the table. So if that, their, their mission comes first. My job is to now get, find some way to hopefully work with you to get them a headquarters that will meet their requirements. And I'd love to have them be part of this conversation as well. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, you know, thanks for your, your responses today. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think it's, it's, I wish all the committee members were here and could understand that a lot of this really predates Ms. Murphy. I remember um, prior to her being nominated and sworn in, we had these same conversations with the previous 
I mean, acting director at the time, Mr. Horn, and, uh, and even before that, about this same building and same concept. I mean, this is nothing new. It may be new to, to the newer members on the committee, but it's certainly not new to this discussion and debate, and unfortunately, we're still spending more time on it. Um, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, I think we, we should all respect the idea that when a new administration comes in, there is new leadership. Sometimes there's just new direction. There's new ideas. There's new vision. There's a new concept, and so it's it's sort of unfair to um, accuse Ms. Murphy of changing course and direction when she's just trying to carry out the direction of the request of a director, a new director who came in just after she did, who just maybe has a different vision for the department. This, this may be a fair conversation for another hearing with the director of the FBI. Now, I have visited the facility. I couldn't agree more. And it's, uh, it is dilapidating. It is falling apart. I was there just, uh, what, four months ago. It is in dire need of demolishing, period, anyhow. Uh, and then certainly they need a new facility. But what I hear that Mr. Ray maybe has done is he said, look, we want to operate differently. We want to, we want to deploy more people out into the field offices and have less people in a centralized location, but in that centralized location, we still need access to our resources and our and our um, intelligence community assets and friends and such that we work with. Just because there is something about that synergy that's helpful for national security purposes, and maybe we could just totally dismiss this notion that. Uh, we have a president in office that's oftentimes criticized by the other side of 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 um, you know poor ideas or lack of direction or incapable uh, of carrying out uh, a mission when in fact what I hear here is that in some way maybe this president is so conspiring that in 2012 or so he and his family um, you know and their organization put a bid in on a project and they wanted in 13 they invested millions of dollars to build a facility foreshadowing the fact that he would run for office, that he would beat 15 other Republicans, and then Hillary Clinton, just so he could get across the street from a building that he didn't want demolished and sold to a private party. I mean, that's a pretty far stretch. I think it's the other way around. Right. Is once he owned it, was he concerned about what was across the street? I. But so then he must just have the appointed. timing is pretty dramatic. A shift ten years of bipartisan support for a project that all of a sudden, overnight, yeah, maybe not so but, much. But prior to, I guess my point being, this predates Miss Murphy, and it actually this debate predates the president being sworn in. And you and I have been on this committee for a while. We know that. Um, but look, I think a lot of what you're saying is true. I said at the beginning to Miss Murphy, I care far less about the fact that I believe that she misled us by not stating the obvious about the meetings at the White House, and far more about how this decision was made and whether she thought it was a good idea and how her notion of how she thought it was a good idea in January changed because just a few weeks later there was a meal, a meeting at the White House with these folks, and then a, a, an email changed shortly thereafter that said, uh, we're changing direction right after this meeting. So right. there are and coincidences, and, and, and then there are just, coincidences, and, and then there's common sense, and, and sir. Just sort of reclaiming my time, the, the, my point being here is that in some cases, that picture, I don't know who all is in that picture, hasn't been shared with the well, committee, we'll but the director, Ray, I imagine, is in that picture. Is he? Is the director in that picture? Uh, well, why don't you ask, uh, yes, Ms. Murphy. So in that picture, you'll see Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein sitting next to him is is FBI Director Ray, then there's me, and then I, I, I believe Mick Mulvaney and General Kelly uh, and the President. So right. it, it, the FBI and the Department of Justice were in that meeting. And that meeting. Who, who was there from the FBI and the Department of Justice? And I'll wait till after, but I just want no, to that's, keep that. No, that's <laughs> Director Ray, is the director of the FBI, was there, and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein was there from the Department of Justice. Right. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. It, and so I guess what I'm hearing through all this, there's been a lot of debate and discussion about where the facility should go, shouldn't go. But there's a part of me that might think that it's less about 
the president trying to block a private entity from building on, on Pennsylvania Avenue, and maybe it's a little bit more about a, an FBI director who has a different vision for the department and wants to do something different, and he has reasons for that. And, and I share that because I've been there. I've met with uh, some of the uh, uh, um, career staff at the FBI, and I've asked the questions, because this has been an, an, an ongoing topic, just to get their, their thoughts. And, and uh, there is a common thread there. And the, the people I talked to were not in that picture. I don't think they've been to a White House. I, they're just normal folks. And so um, maybe we should you know, not pin as much this on Miss Murphy because I think she's trying to do her job and it's a big complex agency she has and Mr. Chairman I'll just close with this because uh, Mr. Chris brought up a point was asking questions of Mr. Cartwright as well but in this letter from the Department of Justice in the FBI to Miss Murphy it says clearly the FBI decided that demolishing and rebuilding the Pennsylvania Avenue facility best balance the equities at stake for the organization. And it addresses the suburban campus and, uh, and such, but it says that maintaining the current location addresses several equally significant concerns, including the proximity to FBI partners, transportation concerns, and reduced land acquisition and parking costs. Now that's, that's from the FBI director, or um, I'm sorry, not director, the associate deputy director. But there was one critical sentence in the end here. It says, we believe that the construction of a secure, technologically advanced facility in the current location near mission partners and multiple forms of transit will best meet the FBI's need. That's from the FBI themselves and not Ms. Murphy. With that, I will yield back. Mr. Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just confused, I guess, um, because it, it seemed that, I think you said for like 10 years this plan to uh, be outside the district had been uh, pursued. The, the prior, yes, the I believe the plan w uh, began at the end of the Bush administration and throughout the Obama administration. That was indeed the uh, that was the plan that GSA was pursuing. So back as far as 2008. Yes. Okay. Um, and and so the idea for that long period of time until I guess January of last year. Until January, to, in my mind, until January f was when GSA learned was January 4th. I believe that uh, records reflect that the FBI began changing its mind as soon as August of, of 2017. Okay. Um, so the, the run-up had been significant. Yeah, yes, but the requirements also changed. So th when GSA and, and GAO and I the FBI have, were... I'm so question. sorry, sir. That's quite yes. right. That's quite right. Um, so the run-up had been a long time. The, apparently a consensus had been developed that it was smarter and wiser, and I guess you defended that, to have the suburban uh, location where other intelligence facilities, after all, are based. Um, and then we have a, a, a change of direction um, where you're going to be able to house less employees, and it's going to be more expensive to do it than what the majority of people, in a bipartisan way apparently, thought was a better way to go. And, and I think what's confusing to some of us at least is if that thought had been uh, embraced by so many for so long, um, it, it's hard to explain why all of a sudden there's a dramatic change in the direction of what should be done with the FBI headquarters. And that's why we're kind of scratching our heads here, some of us. <laughs> some of us are, are not, but um, that's, that's a frustration and, you know, that that you won't let us know, um, you know, who you consulted with, not the content, but even who you consulted with to come before here today is, is a little troubling. If the gentleman would yield, I, I would like to just comment that this debate predates Miss Murphy, predates Christopher Ray. We've had, prior to you uh, being on this committee as well, this is not, it's nothing new. Actually, it, it goes back a couple of years, several years. Um, That's exactly yeah, my point. Right. It, it, it had been in play yeah. for a long time and all of a sudden it got abandoned. There's, there's two different viewpoints and have been even under the previous administration, I think, as well. Where well, it well the go, point where I'm trying to make is, and I think the chairman made it better than me, is that the plan that's being pursued now, the new direction, is to have less people housed in a uh, contiguous location to look out for the safety and welfare of the American people and cost them more to do it. Now, who does that make sense to? 
Uh, may, may I respond, sir? Of course you can. Yeah. Okay. It's not a question, uh, but no, you may. Yeah. Uh, well, you you asked what had changed, and again, I th and I don't want to put myself in the FBI director's shoes because he has far greater insight into the FBI's mission requirements than I could ever hope to have, um, and I'm grateful that he's doing that job. But and I want to be clear, I'm not attacking you. I, no, you know, I, I, I'm trying to find out why a change in decision and direction when it came about. It may or may not have been your decision. I suspect it wasn't because you were defending the suburban location. But so you don't have to no, defend this. No, uh, the, uh, but the, the 2,300 employees that are proposed to move, it's my understanding that they provide payroll administrative support functions so that, the, you know, that they and that in looking at how the FBI headquarters staff was functioned, GSA has its payroll function located in Kansas City. It's still a headquarters function, but it's in Kansas City and operates very well there. Uh, we have, it's there, so it's not unusual that agencies would have administrative functions being carried out on behalf of the agency outside of this, the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and while I've found all this to be uh, fascinating, if in fact there was some uh, movement of this office, we could have some lovely land in the 14th District of Ohio on Lake Erie there that would provide a beautiful setting for the, all 2,300, 5,000, all the employees that would love to come to, to uh, Ohio. But I'm also very interested, pardon? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very supportive of the streamlining of certain government systems for efficiency. But I know a number of my colleagues and I have concerns regarding the suitability of certain healthcare products uh, uh, being purchased on the e-commerce portal. If certain healthcare related products are not exempt, we could see unintended consequences for healthcare facilities and the patients they treat. Could you give us an update on GSA's consideration of either a full exemption or a delayed implementation for healthcare products from the procur procurement through commercial e-commerce portals program? Uh, thank you, Congressman. And I believe you're referring to the um, the FY 2017, I believe it was, NDAA directed the mm -hmm. GSA administrator to put in place an e-commerce platform and a portal. Uh, GSA submitted its Like you didn't have enough on your plate. Uh, this is one of those things where it started off as an idea when I was working on the Hill as a congressional staffer, so it's, it's sort of come full circle. I've been able to watch it evolve and change, and uh, it, it's been a fascinating uh, lesson, and, and but the GSA submitted its first report last March um, detailing how we intended to proceed on the project. Our second report is due this month and we will uh, hopefully be getting it to you, getting it to anyone who's interested by the end of, end of this month. Our plan to proceed though has always been not to look at things like office supplies first. Uh, GSA's own contracting, we delegate responsibility for those healthcare products to the Veterans Administration, believing that they have better subject matter expertise in that to run those. So my, my understanding is that we would be starting with something along the lines of office supplies in any demonstration or pilot program that we run. Um, well, is it possible they'd wait to implement this portal for healthcare products uh, after the programs have been tested so for safety I, and effectiveness? As I said, it would not be for healthcare, pro uh, um, it wouldn't be for healthcare products as we started. It would be for office supplies. Correct, um, but I mean, we, we and, and we would would start with that to, and do it as a proof of concept to make sure that works, and then it, as we continue to test and learn and refine, potentially add new items in. Um, so we're not looking to, and we would especially, at least my inclination would be, we would not start with items that we delegate contracting responsibility to other agencies for. Uh, we would work with things that we have the subject matter expertise in first. And it, that being so, because I know you've got so much time on your hands to, to, to look into these things, but would you make one that would be a, a healthcare specific then versus being one of a general portal for all? So the, the requirement is that we have multiple portals. And so that is already our plan is to have multiple portals. If we get to a point, and again, this is a iterative process by which we're going in doing proofs of con concepts, studying what happens, I think that that would be something we'd be very interested in looking at whether that would make more sense. Um, one thing we are doing right now, though, to make it easier to buy any item GSA sells is, is modernizing our schedules program and the systems that support that, and then we would be able to make those tools available to VA so that would make it easier for anyone in the federal government to contract with uh, those healthcare supply providers and vendors that have already been vetted by VA. Got it. 
And uh, I know I have a little bit of time remaining, but I wanted to uh, let you know that if there's any agency uh, of the federal government that would like to move to the, the 14th District of Ohio, we would welcome them with open arms, and, and our office would help in the procurement process and making sure that they were f they're taken care of and their safety needs will be addressed uh, on the lovely shores of Lake Erie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm tempted to ask you if anyone told you how to answer questions about health care products, but concern that be some uh, assertion of privilege. I'm just kidding. L Mr. Graves brought up. It is covered by Dr. <laughs> <laughs> okay, doctor. <laughs> L Mr. Graves uh, brought up the first White House meeting, and you mentioned who was there, correct? It, was anyone uh, else? In the picture, I want to be clear, that was know, not the someone first else. Meeting. That was That was the first meeting I ever had with the president, okay. uh, that there was a meeting that preceded that meeting that day okay. uh, that had all that had the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, the FBI Director Christopher Wray, the OMB Director okay. uh, Mick Mulvaney, the, you know, General Kelly was the Chief of Staff at the time, and myself, and that was a discussion of the demolish, rebuild versus the renovation in place. So there were, th in my mind, there were three, maybe four decisions that have taken place in this procurement. There was the decision in July of 2017 before it was confirmed to discontinue that procurement, the, the prior lease exchange. There was a decision on the location, which was made by the FBI, in my mind, on the, on the 4th of January of 2018. There was a decision that was made on what were we going to do on that site, so we're going to renovate it or we're going to demolish and rebuild it, and that was made on the 24th by the FBI oh. in, in a meeting with... Oh, okay. Yeah. But I, I just want to clear. I just I told Ms. Graves would just wrap that part up. Okay. So there was a meeting earlier this day yes. at the White House yes. with the people you just referenced. Yes. And this was the second meeting. This uh, that day. That the was White the second House. meeting that day. Okay. And that discussion, you said before, was just about how were we going to pay for it. What we concluded at that meeting was how were we going to pay for this project. Okay. And we agreed that we were going to use a ground lease lease back, and that was a big decision for GSA. In either of those meetings, did you raise any concerns with abandoning the original relocation plan? At, <laughs> again, I, I apologize. Please don't read into this yes or no, but well, I can't it, discuss the, the contents of the conversations. So I, I was can saying, tell you who was there and what we concluded. No, and I get it. And, and just so I can put that yes. on the record. So for the record, you're going to say this had the same answer. Did anyone overrule and push back about your concerns? Uh, did you receive any directions from the President of the United States about these issues? Your answers were all going to be the same about all these meetings, correct? What I, what I can tell you explicitly is that what was concluded on the January 4th meeting was the location. What was concluded in the first meeting that did not have the President in it on January 24th was the how we were going to address the project, the that we were going to do a demolish rebuild. And in the meeting okay. with the President, what we concluded was that we were going to use a ground lease lease back. And the second White House meeting, which is a second date, would be June 15th, correct? There was a meeting on June 15th as well, and, yes. And who was there for that? So all of the individuals from the, uh, from the January 24th meeting were there. And then there were additional individuals um, who were present as well. And who were they? Um, Mark Short was there. Mark who? Mark Short was the yeah. time, I believe, the head of Congressional Affairs. What year are you speaking up to on this June 15th date? It, it's 2018. 2018, 2018 right? Okay, yes. I'm sorry. And um, who else? Don McGann, who was the White House counsel, was there at the time. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember everyone who was there, and I know, um, I know I gave a list to the Inspector General, and they asked me. I apologize, sir. It was nine months ago, and I'm not exact. I, I know there were other people in the room, but I'm not clear. I, I, my memory's not great on it. Okay. Um, and and you're not going to answer any questions about what was discussed, but just generally overview, correct? I can tell you what was concluded, which was that we were going. It, the uh, the topic of the meeting was an update on where we were, and the conclusion was we were to go forward with the plan, as articulated in the. Uh, February 2018. Look, report. I respect you, you've made your decisions. I disagree with them. We're going to conclude with that. But general awareness is a different question. In all that you have been through with this, was any influence that you were aware of, made, saw, heard, was any influence brought to bear that would impact this decision based on? what would help the President's personal interest? None whatsoever. Mr. Graves. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks for your time today. I know this is a lot of um, um, tough questions and, and pointed questions, uh, but but uh, you've, you've answered them to the best of your ability today. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the way you conducted the meeting. You've allowed everybody to have sufficient time, and, and the tone has been um, appropriate. Uh, I would like to, before we leave, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, submit the, the letter from the FBI for the for the record for the committee, uh, and I think no your staff has has that. And uh, you know, Ms. Murphy, I, what I hear from from you is that, in your opinion, the decision about the facility location was made prior to you being, um, I guess, confirmed and sworn in. Is that correct? Is that did I get the timeline so right? I believe that the the FBI director was working on that decision. It was conveyed to me. That was, you know, when I left the meeting on January 4th, it was my understanding that that was the decision. And from that point forward, GSA only worked on, you know, plan and developing plans for how we would rebuild on that site. And that was within, I think, less than three weeks of my being confirmed, after I was confirmed. But, 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 that, but my understanding is that the FBI began working on the idea of the remaining. Prior uh, to you being confirmed, yes. you mentioned they had, they had stepped away from they, that. I that believe contract. they actually they um, they had a contractor who was going through and looking at designs, so that. Uh, and who was I, the I FBI learned, director then? Uh, well, August of 2017 uh, was when Director Ray was confirmed. Mm -hmm. So that was that. So prior to that, the decision in your mind was made. I thought I was I was trying to walk through okay. the timeline. Mr. Quigley had stated there there was a summer. Or maybe you had mentioned there was a summer sort of decision to move away from the. There was a summer suburban. 2017 decision to terminate the lease exchange, because there simply wasn't enough funding right. to go forward with it. Okay. Um, the, which then sort of, and then within I think two to three weeks, the FBI director was confirmed. Mm -hmm. So he became the FBI director at a time when there was was the opportunity to go in and reshape those plans, okay. um, and. He, he took that opportunity um, and, and and began work on what it would mean to stay on that location and that site. Well, and look, you're in a tough spot. I know that, and the chairman's you know highlighted that from the appropriation side. We do have oversight, and so you've been kind to give us as much time as you have today. And I think it is appropriate for us, no matter who's uh, who's in the White House or who's in certain offices or majorities in the House and the Senate that we do recognize sometimes there is a change of direction when there's a change of leadership. In fact, we've noticed that just in the last two months. There's a, you know, in the House, there's there's different decisions being made. There's different direction. Uh, there are different play calls being made that were did not exist uh, the last year. And, and that is just part of the nature of uh, the changing of, of leadership. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's been a good hearing. I appreciate the, the way it's been conducted. And Ms. Murphy, thank you for your time today. And I, I do need to add, uh, Ms. Torres asked that we uh, introduce uh, the interagency agreement between the uh, U.S. General Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Interior into the record. So without objection, I would appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I get you walked into a lot of this. Um, we appreciate your coming back today. Uh, I would just conclude that there are coincidences and, and then there are things that go beyond common sense. And uh, uh, we have more information to uncover. We are aware that there was, a, in response to our letter, uh, a, a document dump, I guess you might want to describe, of 2,500 uh, that we have le yet to see, in the, the letter that we, we sent you uh, asking for information. So we're going to sort through that and see what other information still has to come forward. But we appreciate your sending that and hope that the rest of the request in that letter comes soon. Uh, other than that, we uh, thank you for your participation today and, again, your service. Thank you, sir. Thank you.